Mr. Tatone to explain his vote. Briefly. Really? Ooh, no. <laughs> I know. Uh, for, for quite some time, I've been saying that this is the, the, the very best budget I've ever voted on since I've been here. I came here, you know, and a month later, you know, we had the mortgage meltdown and then the worst uh, uh, recession of our lifetime in, in starting in 2008. I'm sure that's a coincidence uh, um, and, and nothing to do with me and my class that came in in 2007. Um, you know, but I really want to talk very quickly about some of the things that I heard. You know, this budget for Staten Island provides so much. Not only, you know, when we talk about a $1 billion middle class tax cut, a tax break, but uh, for our CUNY school on Staten Island, it provides so much. And for the MTA, yes, it is a dysfunctional uh, authority, but they are providing to Staten Island, and it's something that we have been crying for year after year after year after. And, you know, yes, it comes from bonding, because if we didn't bond it, we would have to raise taxes in order to pay for it. So you either bond it or raise taxes or you do without it, which is so unacceptable. You know, so it's un unfortunate that there are some uh, uh, for on the other side of the aisle who I believe, not all, but some who I believe are who are living in a fact-free life, in a fact-free world that really fail to see what this budget actually does, the good things. And yes, there are disappointments, but these are disappointments that we will clearly, you know, we are all uh, coming together to address them, if not uh, uh, this, you know, towards the end of session, but certainly in the very near future. Things such as the DREAM Act, things such as uh, 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 the, the campaign for fiscal equity. So I want to just really thank my speaker for presenting me with the opportunity to go home with the budget that I have never been happier about and never been proud of. So thank you, Carl, for that opportunity. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I withdraw my re request. I'll be voting in the affirmative. Mr. Tatone in the affirmative. Miss, we can do better. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Miss Nolan to explain her vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and my colleagues. Just very quickly, it is a very good budget for education this year. Um, we didn't get a chance in the debate, but I want to thank Assemblywoman Crystal Peoples-Stokes for her leadership on the community schools, which has really come to fruition in this budget. We mentioned, uh, we mentioned the initiative for our young men. Many, many good things, and we feel good about that. But I would be remiss if I did not, in explaining my vote, also thank each and every one of you for your leadership on the issue of paid family leave. I first introduced a bill on paid family leave in this legislature in 1997. I was building on the work of the former chair of the Labor Committee, Frank Barbaro. The Assembly has passed, since 1997, the Assembly has passed various versions of paid family leave eight times. And it is finally, my son is now 18. I introduced that bill the year before he came into my life. He's now voting. Eight times this assembly voted for paid family leave. And I am so grateful that we have stayed the course on this important issue and so gratified that we have finally been able to convince the, the Senate and the executive to put this issue for our people. Marge Rukemer, who was the Republican Congresswoman who helped create the Family and Medical Leave Act uh, at the federal level, which of course was unpaid, though she was a believer in paid family leave. That was what they could do at that time in 19, uh, the year that they did it. But she said, as society has changed, we've always adjusted our labor protection standards to meet new circumstances. That is very true, colleagues. We have not kept pace with the change in the workforce. Doing a paid family leave bill will finally get us to that goal. And though I know that the support of many men was critical in this bill, I do want to point out that I believe that one of the reasons we have finally reached this goal is the growth, finally, of women in the legislature. Congresswoman Rukuma also said when she got to Congress, she wanted to deal with things like banking and finance. But she learned very quickly that if women in politics did not attend to family concerns, those concerns would not be addressed. We have addressed them today. I know this was important for everyone, but particularly for the women of legislature, and I just thank everyone and vote in the affirmative. Ms. Thank Nolan, you. in the affirmative. <laughs> Mr. McDonald. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, want to join in the excitement of many. With this $150 billion budget, there is a lot to be excited about. A record increase in education aid, a great community school effort that takes a more comprehensive effort at addressing the needs of our children, both in and outside the classroom, the My Brother's Keeper initiative that will have a very large impact for young men and children of color, particularly here in the capital region, a robust anti-poverty effort of $1.5 million each to the cities of Albany and Troy to take a very hard look at how we're going to eradicate poverty in these two cities and our counties, a very reasonable minimum wage that is sensitive to the needs of many and gradually will help bring people out of poverty with all the other efforts that are in this, in this program, an infrastructure program that increases CHIPS funds for our local governments, that increases water and sewer funds for our local governments to help them deal with the issues of neglect that have gone on for decades throughout our state, and yes, a downtown revitalization initiative that brings $100 million to these communities to focus on economic development, to focus on housing, to focus on jobs. These are great efforts. I am very excited about this budget. I thank you for the effort put forth by the team. And of course, I will vote in support. Thank you. Mr. McDonald in the affirmative. Mr. McLaughlin. The other side of the Mick brothers from Rensselaer County. Uh, I have a different opinion on this budget. I'm very pleased to see an increase in uh, education spending and, and many of the other things that we all want to see happen. I think everybody in this chamber wants to help those that are less fortunate, but the way to do that was not from some nebulous number of saying because a governor says $15, a fight for 15 rhymes and sounds good that that's where we should be. We should have gone after aggressively the earned income tax credit and increased that, which by the way is what his father would have stood for. Uh, I think that at the very least, uh, there was no study of this, there's no empirical data, there is no proof that this is going to work, except for the business community, which will tell you it's not going to work. So when you talk about economic reality, that is not theory, that is reality. The, uh, the business community will push back as they have to in order to survive by going automated, by doing kiosks, things like that. That's going to create less, not more opportunity. So when we hear about impacting those that need it, we're about to in a very negative way. And at the very least, as we go forward into these next budget bills that contain this funding for Startup New York and Open for Business, at the very least, can we eliminate that funding because there is no CEO that I know of in the country that is stupid enough to move his country, uh, his company, to the state of New York, given what we're about to do to this economy. I'll be voting in the negative. Thank you. Mr. McLaughlin in the negative. Ms. Hyman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, on the bill. Uh, the forward thinking of this majority body has and will continue to re reverberate throughout the state of New York. While this budget is not perfect, it shows that this House has followed through and received increases in the, min in the minimum wage, paid family leave, increased foundation aid, and community school funding across the state. Successfully, we have funded this innovative program, My Brother's Keeper, which will have a profound impact on the lives of young men in our community. We fought off nearly $1 billion in CUNY and Medicaid cost shifts that would have severely impacted the lives of millions in New York City. I proudly represent the 29th Assembly District and this budget, this house. We have increased money for education, water infrastructure improvements, violence prevention, renewed investment in our social service workers, who will defray this, their students' loan because they will work with children who need their services the most. This is a good budget, but there is still work to be done. Raise the Age was not included, Dream Act was not included, and we still have yet to contend with mayoral control. I look forward to addressing these challenges with my colleagues. We are one state, New York State. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, um, the chairs of the Education and Higher Ed com uh, Committees, and thank you to all my colleagues for your diligence and candor. As this is my first budget, I vote in the affirmative. Ms. Heinemann in the affirmative. Mr. Phillips, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All of the arguments that have been made against the minimum wage are the same 19th century economic arguments that were made when Franklin Roosevelt rejected laissez-faire 
and enacted the minimum wage into law for the first time. In modern economic theory, a reasonable minimum wage enhances growth because low-wage workers lack bargaining power in comparison to Walmart, for example, and thus are paid less than the real value of their labor. When poorer workers have more to spend, it stimulates effective aggregate demand for goods and services. The surest way to assure that upstate New York remains poor is to run a low-wage economy. Low-wage economies have never succeeded in achieving broad-based economic growth. Rather, the reforms of the Roosevelt era, like the minimum wage, built the middle class in this country. Starting in 1980, we abandoned the consensus forged by Roosevelt and moved in the direction of unrestrained markets, which some of our colleagues are again mistakenly advocating for today. The result was the second largest economic collapse in our country's history. The result was the largest accumulation of wealth in the history of our state since the Gilded Age. In 1980, the top 1% of income earners in New York at 11.9% of the income, today their share is 30.2%. On the other hand, low-wage workers cannot afford ever-increasing rents, largely because the minimum wage today is far lower in real terms than it was in 1980. So today, we may not be giving our businesses tax cuts, but we are giving them customers. I withdraw my request and vote in the affirmative. Mr. Steck in the affirmative. Ms. Peoples-Stokes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to explain my vote. I am uh, deeply grateful to uh, Speaker Hasty and the leadership team here who are putting together such a fine budget. I am particularly impressed with the pieces of the budget that deal with education because, as we know, no matter what we do to the minimum wage in this country, if we do not educate people, they will not be successful and they will not make it out of poverty. There have been a lot of attempts to reform and do a better job in our educational institutions, and none of them have really worked as of yet. I personally believe that the My Brother's Keeper model will be successful and the community schools model will be successful to transform, transform communities that are in poverty to communities that flourish in our college communities and our professionals' communities. So it's my pleasure, uh, Mr. Speaker, to cast my vote in the affirmative on this budget, and I do so now. Ms. Peoples-Stokes in the affirmative. Mr. Brennan. Explain my vote. Uh, this subject has only been very briefly touched on uh, during the debate, but uh, the bill we are voting on today also includes the, the framework for the $27 billion MTA capital plan and a $27 billion state DOT road and bridge and other transportation plan uh, for our state. Uh, the MTA plan uh, enables the MTA to have a sufficiently secure footing to submit its plan to the Capital Program Review Board, which uh, hopefully will approve that plan, enable them to go forward with billions of dollars in investments in the safety and reliability of the system. That plan will include additional funding in this uh, budget uh, for uh, the phase two of the Second Avenue subway, enabling the, the, that project to go forward uh, north of 96th Street up to 125th Street in Manhattan and to enable that uh, to begin uh, construction by the end of the capital plan period. Uh, at the same time, the $27 billion capital program, I want to uh, thank all my staff uh, our colleague, Mr. David Gant, you know, was unfortunately um, not here and unable to participate, but I know he would be very happy to know about all of the, as well as all of us, uh, about all of the uh, uh, strengthened road and bridge investments and aviation and rail freight and non-MTA uh, transit investments that we are making uh, that will uh, improve the infrastructure of our state and benefit our people accordingly. So uh, as a result, I will be voting in the affirmative. Thank you. Mr. Brennan in the affirmative. Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the, the opportunity to explain my vote. None of us in our right minds come here expecting any year at all a perfect budget that addresses all of our budget desires. 
Likewise, none of us in our right mind can attest to any claim that this budget is so bad that there's nothing in this budget good enough to deserve our vote. I think our speaker did a fantastic job, and I think we ought to be proud as a body that we came this far and have accomplished so much. This budget puts a smile on hardworking families who struggle to pay rent, find shelter, and dream of sending their kids to school on a wage that's not even good enough for living. This budget pushes back on proposals that would hurt traditional public schools. This budget provides for continued access to poor working families to our public institutions of higher learning. And I could go on and on. There's so much good in this budget that whatever little bad you find, if you're being honest to yourself, you would vote yes. I am very pleased. I am very proud to join my colleagues who overwhelmingly are voting in, in the affirmative to pass this budget so we can go home and tell our constituents the great job we have done. Mr. I withdraw my, my request and vote in the affirmative. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry in the affirmative. Mr. Bichat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to explain my vote today. I uh, first want to uh, thank the speaker, the leadership, uh, Ways and Means, and Education Chair, and everyone who's been, um, been a really big part of putting this robust and successful budget. Um, this budget addressed the issues around economic justice, poverty, as well as education. Um, I'm happy of the following, paid family leave, which uh, gives the family an opportunity to uh, be with their families when they're sick and don't have to risk their jobs. I also am happy about saving the Medicaid and how higher, cost, higher education cost shift from New York City. I am really thrilled about the extra uh, education aid to community schools and high need schools. Um, excited about My Brother's Keepers initiative, which will definitely have a big, big impact in uh, communities of colors, uh, uh, young men of colors. I am excited about the minimum wage um, that is certainly desperately needed in a very high cost of living state such as ours. And I'm excited about the MTA capital plan pushing and mandating um, um, MWBE participation. I look forward to advancing um, in the future campaign for fiscal equity. We certainly need more money um, uh, that is due to our public schools. And I also look forward to advancing the DREAM Act. Um, this, rep this budget represents the New York value and I vote in the affirmative. Thank you. Ms. Bashad in the affirmative. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me thank our speaker, Carl Hastings, our Ways and Means staff for holding the line to ensure our state budget delivered for working families in this state. As Chair of Labor, I am proud to vote for this budget that includes a raised minimum wage. This will significantly impact over 2.6 million people and boost our economy by the billions. More than 40 percent of our state workforce earn and support families at the minimum wage. And no one should work a full day and still live in poverty, unable to pay their rent, pay for food, pay for their heat, keep electricity on. Additionally, we have created New York history by finally implementing the long overdue paid family leave. Again, families will sustain financial stability during the birth of a newborn or the crisis of a loved one. From increasing education aid, restoring CUNY and SUNY, expanding facilitated enrollment, to implementing my brother's keeper, this is a real budget for the working families, and I'm proud to vote in the affirmative. Ms. Titus in the affirmative. Mr. Moya. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to stand up and 
thank uh, Speaker Hasty, uh, Chairwoman Nolan, uh, Chairwoman Glick, uh, and the staff for standing up for students of New York by fighting to protect CUNY and restoring funding for this continued support for the inclusion of the DREAM Act in the budget. It is clear that the Assembly understands the importance of providing our children with affordable, high-quality opportunities to further their education. While we are successful in many aspects of the budget in creating those opportunities, I am deeply saddened that once again, the DREAM Act has been left on the cutting room floor. For another budget, we see that partisan politics has trickled down from the national conversation, which in the end only leaves thousands of young New Yorkers out in the cold in their pursuit of a quality education. But Mr. Speaker, despite my disappointment in that, I want to remove my request and I will be voting in the affirmative. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Moyer, in the affirmative. Mr. Simon. Yes, to explain my vote. I'd like to thank the speaker. I'd like to thank Education Chair Nolan, Higher Education Chair Glick, Labor Chair Michelle Titus, and everyone for their support. This is a historic occasion. We are raising the minimum wage in New York in a historic way, and we are finally, finally providing paid family leave. And I will vote in the affirmative. Thank you. Ms. Simon in the affirmative. Mr. Mosley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To explain my vote, um, I was reading an article the other day, and it talked about the Constitution, that the Constitution was designed to elevate reason, not merely passion and popular will. And I, I believe that this could be reflective in our own state Constitution, that we're not ruled by merely passion, but we're guided by reason. And I think that in this, in this budget provision that we have been guided by the reason, that understanding that we need to raise the uh, minimum wage, that we need to have paid family sick leave, that we need to continue to invest in our education, that we need to continue to understand the need for uh, accessibility to SUNY and CUNY. But at the same time, I also understand that we also have to make sure that we continue to fight for HIV and AIDS uh, uh, our patients. We need to continue to fight for the DREAM Act. We need to continue to fight for Raise the Age, as well as for housing, which I know will be taken care of on the back end uh, of this budget season. But likely, we also know that with the $15 minimum wage that uh, 2.3 million New Yorkers by 2018 will be receiving $15 an hour, an infusion of nearly $16 billion back into our economy. So I want to congratulate our speaker. I want to congratulate Denny and the leadership team. I want to congratulate Kathy and Michelle and their team. Uh, I want to congratulate Dr. Lester Young um, from, the board, uh, from the Regents and, and Commissioner Elia. Um, as well as uh, former Commissioner uh, Merrill Tisch and her leadership, as well as uh, uh, Chancellor um, uh, uh, Rosa for uh, their My Brother's Keeper initiative, which to me is, is going to hit home for me as a, a father of a young uh, brown uh, little boy in Brooklyn. We know that their plight is tied inextricably to the plight of our, of, our, of our state and of our economy. So I vote in the affirmative. Thank you. Mr. Mosley in the affirmative. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 97, noes 38. The bill is passed. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we could go to page three of the A calendar and take up rules report number 28. Clerk will read. Assembly number 9003D, rules report 28, budget bill an act making appropriations for the support of government. On a motion by Mr. Farrell, the Senate bill is before the House. The Senate bill is advanced. Governor's message is at the desk. The clerk will read. I hereby certify to an immediate vote, Andrew M. Cuomo, Governor. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. The clerk will record the vote.
Mr. Murray to explain his vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, in this particular bill, we, it's very interesting considering uh, some of the bills we've taken up and, and the last one in particular regarding the minimum wage and things of that nature. It's a section in this bill regarding economic development and in particular talking about the $66.5 million that we're putting um, towards the uh, economic development initiatives and marketing of New York. Now, part of that, $27 million, will be dedicated for tourism promotion services, which I think is fantastic. We should be promoting what we have to offer here in New York. But that leaves about $39.5 million that will be uh, there to utilize the, with the governor's Open for Business initiative and Global New York. Now, Global New York supports the international domestic trades missions, while the Open for Business initiative supports Startup New York advertising. I think it's really interesting that we just covered last night that already the taxpayers are going to fund the, the, the bill for this 39.5 million for the advertising. We're also going to offer up tax credits for the commercial production company who's going to put together the Cuomo promos. Uh, but then it goes even further uh, when we're talking about in the language of the bill, it says for the Startup New York, provided that in the event funds are used for the purpose of advertising and promoting the benefits of the Startup New York program, no more than 60% of the funds used for such purpose shall be used for advertising and promotion outside of the state of New York. Shouldn't it be a minimum of 60%? It should be spent outside since the whole point of that promotion is supposed to be bringing companies to the state of New York. Why are we guaranteeing 40% of these promos are going to be running inside the state at taxpayer expense? Especially considering now that we've raised the minimum wage and all our wonderful business uh, climate rankings, I don't think we're going to have a lot of CEOs clamoring to, uh, to come to New York in the first place. So we could save the taxpayers literally tens of millions of dollars by scrapping that whole Startup New York program. So I'll be voting in the negative. Thank you. Mr. Murray in the negative. Mr. Palumbo to explain his vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to rise and explain my vote and abstain from voting. Now, I addressed this in the early morning hours um, today about OPWDD and the minimum wage. So regardless of whether or not your position on minimum wage is that it's a good idea or it's a bad idea, in a not-for-profit, they don't have so-called profits to... to to work our way into in order to cover these additional costs. I think we all agree there are going to be additional payroll costs. So when we think about adding and, or raising the minimum wage and payroll costs, payroll costs by 66%, we have in this budget bill $2.25 billion for the community services program, and the minimum wage fringe benefit salary support is $4.1 million. That is 0.018% of that total budget. So we have less than 1% when payroll costs overwhelm OPWDD. How do we forget about these people and these, these individuals in our society? This is what government is about, is taking care of people who are disabled mentally and physically. We have adults who will have services cut if we do not properly fund OPWDD. I don't know how we can forget about this. So we need to look alive here. This needs to be adjusted immediately. Because that when those services come, uh, when, uh, when, the, when, the, when the increases come, these people are, go are going to do, have no, no choice other than to cut services to our disabled and mentally ill. So uh, again, regardless, I, I mentioned this earlier today, I did want to follow up. Um, it's not a share concert. Yes, we did go home and change my suit. So no, I, I do look different than I did this morning. But. Um, I, w I withdraw my request, and I'm voting in the negative for that reason, Mr. Speaker. We need to keep these folks in mind. They're our most vulnerable citizens in this state. Mr. Palumbo in the negative. Mr. Abenati. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am very pleased to support this, this budget, uh, which uh, gave us a significant increase in state aid for education, gave us a significant increase uh, in the minimum wage, and in this particular bill gives us a significant increase in support for operating aid for our libraries. And the next bill that we're going to vote on will give us a significant increase in the capital funding available for our libraries. So I want to thank the uh, speaker and uh, our committee chairs and our staff uh, for doing an excellent job on uh, increasing these funds for our education, for our workers, 
and uh, for our libraries. Mr. Abenhati in the affirmative. Mr. Lupinacci. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, as I explain my vote. There we go. There Hope we go. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, um, some positive things in this budget, especially when we look at the education portion of the budget. Um, library aid is being increased $4 million from last year. And it's good always to see the teacher resource and computer training centers, because I know the governor each year plays a little game with the funding in this, and it was eliminated. It was good to see that we were able to restore $14.3 in funding for teacher centers in the 2016-2017 year, especially as we continue to keep up with um, differences and changes in the curriculum and what we're evaluating teachers on, it's good to see they have the resources to continue to provide opportunities for the teachers to learn. So for these reasons, and also some positive things, the higher education portion of this, I will be voting yes, Mr. Speaker, so thank you. Mr. Lupinacci in the affirmative. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 109, noes 10. The bill is passed. Mr. Morelli. Yes, sir. If I were the pilot, I'd be saying now sto store your tray tables and put up your seat back. So <laughs> let's uh, move to, uh, if we can, on page three, rules report number 29. Clerk will read. Assembly number 9004D, rules report 29, budget bill an act making appropriations for the support of government. On a motion by Mr. Farrell, the Senate bill is before the House. The Senate bill is advanced. Governor's message is at the desk. The clerk will read. I hereby certify to an immediate vote, Andrew Cuomo, M. Cuomo, Governor. Mr. Palomasano. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, will the, uh, Mr. Farrell yield for a few questions, please. Mr. Farrell, will you yield? Thank yes. you. Mr. Thank you, Denny. Farrell yields. Uh, Denny, I just got a, a, a couple questions for you. Uh, first, I know we were having a discussion when we were talking about the MTA, the dedicated fund. Yes. That uh, the agreement had uh, followed the agreement that the mayor and the, the governor announced back in October that those funds wouldn't be diverted like they have in the past and just be used for capital. And when we were talking about that, I asked the same thing about the DOT capital plan. Would is there going to be a diversion of those funds like it's been in the past? Is it going to address that question? And you said, uh, from now on, I guess paraphrasing that, no, they won't uh, be diverting those funds from the de yeah. uh, dedicated fund. My, my question is, just to, for clarification purposes, uh, if that's true, wouldn't then the DMV and the DOT uh, uh, snow and ice removal funds, does that mean that they're no longer being taken out of the dedicated bridge and highway trust fund now and now and being taken care of separately because that's not capital that's that's operations or is that yeah. still that's why I just want a little clarification yeah. Huh? yeah it has not changed from what we did last year so it's the same as it's money in the past yes so then really that the although the MTA plan is making sure that there's no diversion from the capital. The DOT uh, capital plan still continues ongoing that it's not going out of the dedicated bridge and highway trust fund. Yes. Okay. Uh, Denny, on the, um, the CHIPS program, uh, it's my understanding that the CHIPS funding is level at $438 million. Is that correct? Yes. And the winter recovery money, the $50 million that was in the budget last year, has been removed. Is that correct? Oh, uh, we did for Pave New York 500 for five years, 500 million for five years, and we'll be doing a 100 million this time. 